Hello, everyone, and welcome to another virtual Meet the Festival, reuniting cast members from our current video series of Stratford Festival Films. I am Beck Lloyd, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, I'll be relaying audience questions, posing your questions to our actors here from the 2014 production of Antony and Cleopatra, directed by Gary Griffin, the film of which is now streaming free of charge until July 23rd. I just want to say first that I'm fairly certain I will be um, sort of internet booted off of this meeting at some point, which is going to be a really fun game for us today. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm beaming in from somewhere new, and so the internet connection is a new relationship, and uh, just like any other new relationship, we're working out the quirks. Um, so good morning. Let's make sure everyone knows who we have here, shall we? Um, so collectively today, we have over 35 years of experience with the festival. So I wanna deliver a huge thanks to E.B. Smith, Garenwin Davies, Yana McIntosh, and Antoine Yared. Um, I would love it if we could go around and you could let us know who you were playing in the 2014 production of Antony and Cleopatra. Maybe you could tell us a fond memory from that 2014 season. Um, and where are you tuning in from or, or beaming in from uh, today? Gare, do you want to get us started? Okay, so I'm Gare. Who you playing? A little memory. A little memory, okay. I'm Gare. I uh, played Anthony in the production. I am uh, beaming in from uh, northeast of Peterborough. And a uh, couple, well, okay, a couple little anecdotes. Well, um, yeah, uh, we won't discuss Antoine's nipples, but that was one. And... <laughs> And 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 EB EB uh, and I uh, well we came up with this idea with Yana and Gary and everything about uh, us playing like children a little game of horsey thing Ebs do you remember? Oh, and I, remember I of that. course went hey Ebs why don't we go blah 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 well of course EB's back let's just say said dude what are you eating <laughs> like you know uh, anyway I, I carried the weight of uh, Rome actually. E.B. carried the weight of Rome on his shoulders. So we came up with a different opening. I, I can't remember, Yana, who you had on your back, but anyhow, there was lots. There were a <laughs> lot of little anecdotes in that little production, but yes, so, hi. <laughs> Thank you so much and welcome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can I go next? Yes, please. Oh, oh okay, okay, next. Um, I'm Yana McIntosh and I played Cleopatra. Uh, and the first thing, for some reason, I don't know why, there were lots of things to think about. The first thing that leapt to my mind when you asked that question was, I seem to remember, Antoine, a lot of backstage preparation around the hookah yes. and the smoking of the hookah. Mm -hmm. We had to pick a flavor and then every night I think there was some kind of little dealy with a crew person about the hookah. I don't know. I don't know why that came into my mind, but that was <laughs> Yeah, we had to go outside during the show. I had to go outside with a crew member um, and get it ready. Like, well, I didn't really have to go outside. I yeah, I just showed up with the wings. <laughs> get it ready for you. Uh, okay. yeah. Hi, I'm Antoine. I'm uh, currently in Toronto. Um, I played Mardian, the fabulous eunuch. Oh, best. <laughs> I think best we did ever. I think we should talk about my nipples. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't wearing very much in the show um, on the top half. And uh, the day of uh, the filming, um, in the very first scene, like within the first two minutes, uh, Gare had a moment where he comes around and puts his arm around my shoulder and he decided to pinch my left nipple. And it's, it's there on film for all, for all to see. <laughs> I, I hope it's better. I don't, I, it's doing <laughs> fine, it's doing fine. <laughs> it's okay. It's so sad. Um, I'm, I'm EB, I'm currently in Athens, Ohio. Uh, I just moved here from Stratford about three days ago, so I apologize for the mess around me. Um, but uh, funny stories from this show, there were a lot of them. Gary, I, I think I wasn't the only one that carried you on my back, Gary. There were several of us, I think, including Carrick Osborne, who had to Carrick, climb yeah. Climb with oh, you up a the hill. Oh, the <laughs> end of it. That's brutal. Honestly. Easy. Um, and, and I also learned on the show that I don't ever feel the need to wear a sarong again for the duration of a production. So wrong. 
I think. Yeah, I guess they're wrong <laughs> so, in so many wrong. ways. Uh, oh, I played, I played Alexis. He looked uh, great. Thank yeah. you. I think Actually, that was a fun great. court. That court was so much fun. Yeah, I thought mm. it was a pretty, it was a pretty hot amazing. court. Yeah, pretty yeah. hot court. We looked amazing. Yeah. That's why he didn't stay in Rome. <laughs> right. He was oh. tempted, tempted by the fashion. Yes, fashion and joy. <laughs> I think Beck's frozen. Is she frozen again? I, oh, I think Beck's frozen. So I think we should all freeze for we all freeze in 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 in, in what in solidarity. Yeah. Oh, she's back. Oh, there's back. Her back. There she Hello. is. <laughs> and I'm back with with new news. Uh oh. Uh, uh oh. No, you're not. Oh. <laughs> hey, Eves. Just yes, tell sir. us about uh, what you're get uh, what you're studying for, just for a minute until Beck's back. Uh, I've come to Ohio University to study uh, for my Master of Arts Administration and my PhD in Interdisciplinary Arts. And I'm planning on going well, for a know, swim. If, That's all I'm doing. If, if we can't be on stage, why not do something That's, productive? Yeah, did you set that up as soon as COVID hit? Were you that quick thinking? Uh, basically, yeah. I had, I had a professor yeah. of mine, from, this is my alma mater too, so I had a prof prof professor of mine from undergrad contact me and ask if I wanted to come do the Master's and then that turned into a whole whole course of study through the PhD. Oh, wonderful. That's Eve, brilliant. Are you, are you going to be, are the classes going to be online at first? What's the situation? It sounds like at the moment we're going to be in person. Oh, oh wow. Okay. In September with, with strict social distancing guidelines and 30 person classes and giant lecture halls, you know. And what is Ohio like? Is it one of the places where things are surging or? Uh, we had a, we had a rough last week. Um, but it's been generally pretty good here, so I'm hopeful that that'll. Do people wear their masks hold. there? Uh, some, probably thirty percent, I oh, guess. Uh, it's a little, little frightening going grocery shopping, <laughs> but yeah. you know. You know, if we were going to do Antony and Cleopatra again, either the Egyptians or the Romans could wear masks. And then the other side not wear masks. And with, the, just, with the way that court was working out, man, we there was no social distancing happening. No, no, that's court. true. That's true. <laughs> no, uh, we, we, were, we were pretty friendly. Sharing Yay, Beck! Hey, Beck! Hey, Beck. How are you guys doing? What, what are we talking about? <laughs> we were just discussing Evie's uh, uh, wonderful MA and his PhD things in Athens. Oh, awesome. And, and a little and bit about Social masks. distancing in the Egyptian court as well. Yeah. In, in, okay. Uh, yeah. I love it. I, I love apologize. It. I had to distance myself because I thought I had turned my phone off <laughs> and it just rang. So I'm oh, sorry. Okay. About that. Okay. We're All doing right. How are we doing? We're, We're doing good. good. So I'm uh I'm waiting for some questions to come in. Um but I love, I mean, I love that we're talking about what's happening in our lives. Um, has everyone had a chance to to watch the the video, the the movie, I should say? Oh, yep. Yeah. I yeah. have watched it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, watched it twice. <laughs> oh, good. Yes, I as think we, I'm at... as, as we discussed back, uh, I'm doing uh, like my mom. I'm watching it in 15 minute seg segments or whatever. So. Yeah, I think I'm going to do that with Pericles and when Taming yeah. of the Shrew comes out. I think there's something to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then you can have a break. You can discuss it amongst yourself. Yeah, um, if she's willing to have a conversation with me about how that goes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, so, I would love that. Here, did you, you say and, you could discuss it amongst yourself? Like she yes, yes exactly. <laughs> Me and all my friends. Yeah. Uh, that would be a pretty epic sort of like scrapbook journal situation of, of your thoughts every 15, every minutes. 15 minutes. Well, see, one, one thing that we were going to do, uh, we had an idea for, for this uh, internet world that we are in, was uh, mm. we we're going to have two actors not dissimilar to the folks on The Muppets, or whatever, and and during the show, rather than just a what you know a viewing party, we were going to uh, criticize the performances uh, during the show. Like the uh, two and, old geezers up in the. Yeah. Up in the oh my gosh! Yeah. Yeah, and, and but I thought that maybe it was uh, maybe you know you you'd have to take things back, and you really didn't want to do that, you know. So, because and I'd mostly actually go after myself. Uh, I, really, you should have people in the show doing it, so that you know you can actually. <laughs> Yeah, you can easy. call, you know people's numbers, so you can call them and apologize after, so to say. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you, you know it's fun and games and it's all love. 
Um, well, you know, I, I said this in our in the interview, but watching it six years later, I felt like I was doing that for my performance for the whole thing. That's why I couldn't watch it on Thursday night again because I was just like, I'm done. You know, it's hard when you look back on work, especially several years on. It's hard not to be critical. You know, it's yeah. just. Uh, yeah. I mean, I find anyway. Maybe maybe you guys don't find. No, no. Wow. No, I, I have a hard time watching myself every time. It could be six months ago. Because you can point out things that you would, you, you say to yourself, you know, I would do that differently. Is it that specific? I would do that differently or you just feel, you know, a moment that you maybe um, might understand more deeply mm -hmm. with yeah. a little more experience, a little more time. Um, mm -hmm. Or you remember things that gave you problem mm -hmm. that, you know, maybe, because we always assume that, because we're doing the play, mm. that we answered all the questions, that we solved all the problems. Well, you don't. Some things you have to just get over, mm -hmm. carry on with. Um, and so when you when you have the privilege, which is what it is, of, of having something recorded for forever, mm -hmm. you, you're still able to see some of those areas where you maybe didn't solve it or you know you didn't solve it. And, yeah. you and there was... Also, in, in the Tom Patterson, Yana, and guys, uh, the it, it, it's a different kind of performance than in the festival or the Avon. Um, and I found, I what I found about watching myself in it, I, it was too, like it was too big. It was just mm -hmm. too big for, for the, that might have suited the, the, you know, the, the 360 acting. But oh, it just I thought, shush, take it down a notch, you know. <laughs> Talk to me, don't shout at me. That feeling too, isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah. I feel every time I watch almost yeah, yeah. It's basically how I feel every time I watch myself in any of them, is that it looks beautiful, but sometimes the close-ups um make it so that you feel like you're way too loud. Yeah. But but I have to say that. I find myself not being very that critical of anybody else on film. It's just me. So mm -hmm. I never find anybody else too loud. It's just when I'm on screen. So I think maybe that's. Yeah, maybe. I agree. I, I thought the I, three of you, the three of you were terrific. Yeah. I think I they need out to in that They need they... to invent just self canceling headphones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Well, when we start doing 360 theater and you, you'll be wearing the, the camera on your head. Mm -hmm. I've just decided this is going to be a thing um, yeah. so that the audience can feel like they're there with you and it'll be from your perspective. So you'll be good. You, it'd, you'll be great, it'd, it'd be great to have everyone with GoPros on. So <laughs> every, everybody. Just, just a, a crown of them sort of yeah, studded just all GoPros around. around the crown. Yeah. Exactly. So just to show you how kind of out of it, the tech world I am, when you said that, that guy was like, oh, when's that going to happen? Is that, <laughs> right. is that a thing? I know, I'm pretty convinced it, it may still. So. It absolutely should be. Oh, it will, it will. I've just put us on the forefront. Um, <laughs> so I think we uh, we should maybe get to some questions because people are, are sending them away. Right. Um, I mean, I could chat and have tea and coffee with you forever, but. Well, that's. Um, so you were talking about Garrett being, being on that stage. Um, Jeff Scott has a question um, exactly about that. He, he says, the Tom Patterson stage, was such an amazing place to view this play. Clearly the director and production team designed it carefully for the space. Can anyone speak to playing on that long thrust? I actually think in, in live situation, hi Jeff, uh, in live situation, it was perfect for that play. Yeah. Um, I found actually even more for Egypt than Rome. There was something about mm. the Egyptian court that lent itself to that runway, that entrance. And it was it was big. It was bold. It was in your face. It was uh, it was a delight. I found that. And with Yana and myself having to do some of those dancey uh, uh, around scenes, the bed and all that. Around, stuff. It, just, it was great. It was you had you had all that space around you. You didn't feel at all hemmed in. There was something freeing about to playing Antony and Cleopatra for me in the Tom Pabst. There is something about, um, you know, the, the demand to like move your neck when you're watching something makes you, I find for me as an audience, it asks me to participate in play because I can't just sit back and face front. And mm -hmm. even though I was watching it on, a, on my screen, I could feel that like that ask to participate because mm -hmm. these big 
crosses happen. I mean, you can really strut your stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with what you said to Gare about uh, particularly for Egypt, because yeah. watching it too, I mean, one of the things that I was delighted by um, was to see some of those entrances through, you know, through the, from the back down the runway for, for Cleopatra. That was great to have, um, to have that, that path, that, that runway to, to play on. Well, yeah. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, because Egypt was more about passion and personality and, and, and play and uh, things like that. And, and Rome was more about politics and discussion and uh, positioning. It, there was something there was something more solid about the Roman uh, world and something more fluid about the Egyptian world. So that, that I think also lent to that. I'm in a rocking chair, by the way. This is what you do in your dotage. <laughs> and then I can't really remember what happened in the second half. Uh, but, but so. We're so That's lucky it. you remembered all those lines. Uh, I think, I think we had to re-record them. I think we re <laughs> you had an earpiece, didn't you? Yes, exactly. Actually, yeah, that's no, why they actually, filmed you from this side. <laughs> it was Evie and, and Antoine that were going, no, no, it's this, it's this. Oh, thank you, thank you. So yeah. they, they helped. I some of that, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it was Eb in, um, in the Meet the Festival with the Pericles uh, cast, where you talked about um, the Tom Patterson. And I think it's Scott Wentworth who refers to it as a, as a raw theater. Is that the phrase? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, in terms of it, you know, not not being built for that use. Yeah, it was a badminton court. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the theater sort of took it over and and constructed a theater inside of it, and and so I think I think that's part of the reason it has that magic, that that sort of fluidity to it, because it has to be whatever you make it into. You know, it, it's not it doesn't force you into the con the confines of a theatrical convention really, because it doesn't have any. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm surprised they haven't done the production of Bye Bye Birdie. <laughs> Thank you. It's a, it's a badminton joke. It, it's, it's a... No, no, I, I'm with you. <laughs> Sorry. I'm out. Sorry, Sorry guys. Gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna um, walk that you one. Know, I was going to say that, uh, yeah, I knew that it, I know that it was a badminton court, um, but I don't know. It, it was in its former iteration, uh, it was my favorite theater. Mm -hmm. to play in and to watch in. Um, I mean, I love the festival. I love a little studio, but there was something about that Tom Patterson that thrust into the audience that way that I just really, really dug. And being yeah, that, really close to them too. Like, you know, if you didn't look sharp, you could step off onto somebody's foot. You yeah. know, in the front row. So, and, 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 and more than any other theater, you if you watch the show twice from two different places, you could have completely different stories. Different Absolutely. <laughs> Don't Absolutely. you think also that it's it, it was the backstage too of the old Tom Patterson because mm -hmm. we were you you were invited indeed forced in one way to be a real team a real company because yeah. there was very little separation um, you know uh, you the go green room was in the stage management office you were yeah kitchen <laughs> stage management green room yeah. Um, yeah. places where wonderful. folks fix some costumes shared bathrooms kind of kind of summer camp. So it was kind, of, and then you all had to congregate outside the back door. You know, folks would be having, uh, you know, uh, basically little picnics and things. And you think, wow, inside they're they're in Egypt and Rome. Wow, that's so weird. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's something all encompassing about that Tom Patterson uh, experience. Yeah, before. I do remember you that season during during Mother Courage, taking a bedroll out there and sleeping for most of the show when you weren't on stage. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's true. I was the cook. I, what do I know? That's right. <laughs> oh, Bex, Bex gone. Oh, no, Bex, there she's back. There she is. There she is. We were doing so well. <laughs> oh, it's good. It's good. <laughs> really had um, a, a, a good run there for a bit. <laughs> um, okay, so when I exit the the Zoom world, um, my my questions disappear. So I'm going to paraphrase this question, Cynthia. So. Um, uh, I, I read it t twice and I apologize if I get it wrong, but I got the gist of it. So Cynthia wants to know, um, uh, sort of asking about uh, what it takes to play characters that are based 
on real people, on real historical figures that come with these massive reputations. And other than the Shakespeare text, what were some of the resources you used um, to prepare yourselves uh, to, to, to enter this world and, and um, to take on these like prolific and, and legendary uh, people um, that are based, you know, in a reality? So I got this question a little bit in my in my little interview that we did mm -hmm. on, for the screening, and um, I said that uh, one of the things I find when you're playing a real person is that you 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 got not just your play and what the playwright is giving you, but there is a responsibility a responsibility that one feels to who was that actual person, what were they like, what was what were they going through, and so it requires that much more um, uh, reading, uh, outside reading beyond the play. Um, uh, I, I cannot remember the author, but I know there was a giant biography of Cleopatra that I uh, came across, the, I think maybe the year before I was thinking that we were gonna start. Um, it was just called Cleopatra, and I grabbed it and picked it up and used that as a, a major resource. Um, uh, but then there's the whole issue of, you know, there is the real life of the person, and there is the play that we have to do. And so I talked about the difficulty sometimes of squaring the reputation, the history, the background, the reality of the, of the figure with the story that the play needs to tell. So um, sometimes I guess the, the job is to not get so wedded to the history or what you've read and you know, to the best of your ability to, to be faithful to it, but not be so wedded to it that you can't do the play. Mm -hmm. And also I think that some, we always fall when we do these uh, these historical uh, dramas or comedies or whatever, uh, somewhere between the, the the scale, because they were bigger than anything we could ever do. And I also sometimes think they were somewhat more disappointing than anything. So we can't we can't really hit those either heights or, or uh, depths. So we have to come into this, which is just, uh, you know, it's our interpretation of that. So it, it, it's scale. It's an interesting thing about scale and learning about the thing. You know, uh, there's a lot written about Antony as well. Uh, and it's their relationship. You know, if you go, uh, he was married so many times, uh, you know, he, he's a bit like Mickey Rooney or something. Uh, <laughs> Mickey Rooney as Antony. Oh. <laughs> exactly. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. I, I have no. Uh, I know who Mickey really is right now. But no. yeah, so there's a lot more reading. But for me, it's finding the tone and and the relationship between the two individuals playing those parts. Really, that's what it, it comes down to. You know, Jan and I can act in our own bubbles if we want, but you have to share. You have to share those bubbles in order to get the play to work. I think. Mm -hmm. That's a very COVID timely description. Oh, I know. Yeah, you're using all the buzzwords. Thank God we didn't have to keep six feet away, Yana. Gonna, this I is going to trend. Was, this is going to trend. I was all over yeah. you like a virus. Um, any prep, um, EB and Antoine, I know, I know maybe not as like big legends, uh, you know, following, following the characters that you were exploring at the time, but was there a particular research that you did? Um, rooting yourself in this this history, or was it? There was some or? there was some research on 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 how the Egyptian court operated because you know as Gary was talking about earlier, it was in in fact a bit more fluid in terms of its structure than the Roman court. The mm -hmm. the sort of tasks and roles weren't as clearly defined uh, in some ways. Um, but you know, I think you when you when you're playing a, a supporting role like that, you have to. You have to create that out of a whole bunch of information, uh, pulling from this and that in terms of what worked for the part. So it, it really doesn't, you don't have the same kind of uh, critical and scholarly analysis of the real person to go off of, right? So it's a bit more of an invention, a bit more of a, a construction from the ground up. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It, it was, you know, research, but mostly invention. 
and discovery in the room. I mean, for myself, um, I think understanding why um, <clears throat> why a eunuch becomes a eunuch and what his um, purpose is in the courts, in terms of uh, his place in society, the things that he becomes permitted to be um, witness to um, and what he's not. Uh, Could so you, just for those watching who may not know, who may not know that word, oh, yeah. um, can you expand on that for, for folks? Yes, a eunuch is a man uh, who has his testicles removed. And so therefore uh, is become allowed to be a servant um, to someone of higher standing. He's allowed into the women's quarters. He's allowed into places where men would not be permitted to be. Mm -hmm. uh, they act as servants or as guards. And, um, and by removing their testicles, you know, they remove the sort of desire for, or the possibility for uh, sexual motivated uh, purposes or, yeah, it basically removes <laughs> an yeah. important part of what their life can be about. And so therefore it gives them per permission to access things that they wouldn't normally. Mm -hmm. It also removes. Well, one of the most interesting scenes for me in the play is actually when Antoine's character comes and brings the news of Cleopatra's uh, death. And, and in that delivery of that information has an opinion, has uh, challenges, uh, Anthony. It's not just a passive kind of, character so it's interesting that you know Shakespeare took that uh, the eunuch and gave uh, uh, the character such such a voice because I, I know it's not a huge scene but it's a really I think a very defining moment mm -hmm. I mean I was watching it and I had forgotten how hot I came in <laughs> yeah 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 it was like, uh, buddy, you can get your head cut off. Uh, you know, uh, I was like, that is a really bold. <laughs> that is, but but yeah, I think he was permitted, and even with in, with interactions with Cleopatra, he's given a lot of elbow room to to let his personality shine through. Mm -hmm. uh, he, you know, he he can he can take the the jabs and um, you know the derision, but it also I think gives him his character, his personality, quite a, a, a power. Mm. Yeah. That's, thank you so much. That's so interesting. Um, Jana, I've got a question. Yeah. Specifically uh -oh. for you, but I'm not. Yeah. Oh, look close. <laughs> so close. There she goes. Come on. Let's, let's try to guess what Beck's going to ask. Uh, <laughs> costume question. Yeah. Well, I think actually it's about what tea you're drinking right now. It's a tea I'm drinking that made me extremely hot. I forgot. I got hungry watching Bet drink coffee and I thought, oh, I'll just make a cup of tea. And then I forgot it's like a hundred degrees and I would be very hot. Yana, speak to the marriage between voice and movement that created such a, a hello, a vibrant um sensuality oh vibrant sensuality yeah that's right <laughs> yeah. oh that's an interesting question so hmm the marriage between voice and movement oh i don't know that i consciously worked on voice and movement being married um i'm i guess i'm just sort of floored by vibrant sexuality because like We've already stated all I all I felt watching it was stop screaming. Um, uh, no, I mean she's a powerful woman, so she she commands her she commands her court with her voice. Um, but she's all they, it seems like a very tactile, a very sensual court, and so bodies are in motion bodies are fluid bodies are touching each other and and you know playing with each other all the time i don't know that i consciously thought of wedding them i think like i don't really think of them being separate do you know uh i feel that th they're intertwined in a way that may makes that question hard to answer it wasn't a conscious effort it was 
born of what I felt about the court and my other players and how we played together and what was what was the demand of the scene. Mm -hmm. My answer would be uh, the dance belt I was wearing. But uh, yeah, I, I thought so too, yeah. And those tap <laughs> lessons I think made a difference for you. <laughs> I think Antoine and I were just always hungry because we were wearing nothing and eating nothing at the time. We looked, we looked, we looked amazing. We, we did. We, I remember there, there was one day where the two of us yelled at everyone in the green room for eating cake. Uh, we actually snapped and we were like, this is so rude of you people. It was <laughs> not, a, not a shiny moment. Pre-COVID, we would not I would have asked for like a few more layers if we had to do this show now. Yeah, <laughs> me too. At least a tunic or something, I don't know. Please, like just something. Um, but the, I mean, the costumes are stunning. They're really good. Really yeah, I mean, to pick up more, I think Beck's frozen again, but I think I'm just thinking, picking up on that question, you know, costume plays a lot into that too. Mm -hmm. you know, playing a queen that is, for all intents and purposes, dressed in a nightgown or a sundress is different than playing a queen who has to be corseted under, you know, 20 pounds of fabric. Yeah. So there's more that, there's more of one body that one has available to one, that one can access, can bring to the characterization than in most others of Shakespeare's plays. Yeah. Did you hear any of that, Beck? I didn't, but I know it was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. As, as this goes on, you're more and more. Yeah. Be Beck's melting. <laughs> <laughs> She's not you know, freezing. You know. She's not freezing, you're melting. So that's what it is. Yeah, this is um, very reflective of, you know, I come in, I got my pen and paper, even when I'm watching the movies, you know, I'm like ready to be diligent with my observations. I'm here, um, today I arrive, got my coffee and my water, ready to put my best foot forward and, and then the computer decides how it's gonna go. Right. Yeah, I think it's genius. <laughs> you have yet to um, freeze the weird look on your face, so that's something. I, am I freezing with funny looks? No, you look amazing. No. Oh, okay. It's no, nice, and then, we, then it takes a while for us to realize you're frozen. Yeah. yeah. All right, you think I'm just being polite? Yeah, yeah you're just <laughs> listening. <laughs> By the way, Charlotte no. Dean was the designer, and, and Charlotte yes. did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now is Beck this rose again? She's, She's deking us out. She's gone. <laughs> Thank God this isn't tennis. Shira will maybe get a question up on the chat or somebody. Wait, I just want to mention that, of course, during our rehearsals, Gary hurt himself. I've got a question here. Before the rehearsal, wasn't it? Before rehearsal. Yeah, before. He had just moved to town. He had just, he had just moved to his town house. and fell down the stairs that night yeah. and was out of rehearsal That's for right. how long? I was trying to remember how long he was gone for. It wasn't very long. For a while. So I've got a question here from Jackie Z. Oh, good. Cleo's court, like everyone has been saying, feels very intimate. So it seems strange to me for E.B. and Antoine's characters to just drop from the story. How did you guys reconcile that? Yeah. Um, huh. My character stays almost till the very end. He brings the yeah. he brings in the the old men with the figs. The soothsayer. Uh, oh, not the soothsayer. The fig guy. Yeah. The fig guy. So yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't get a goodbye, which is which is unfortunate. Yeah, uh, it, it would have been nice to get um, you know, I left you a basket full of money <laughs> left on the back porch. Um, um, I have a jar with something that's really special <laughs> that used to belong to you. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm not sure what happened to Alexis. <laughs> Figs and <That's> nuts. <laughs> I mean that that was joke. Well together. That joke. You really you encapsulated the joke. Figs and nuts. Thank you. Thank you. Um yeah. What about but EB, you can you come in as someone Yeah, I disappear as Alexis. I, I I I don't know that we ever really worked out where he went after he after that last scene. And well Shakespeare yeah. doesn't work it out, does he? No. So no, so I don't, I don't think we made a decision. But I did come back as a as a Roman soldier uh in the second half of the play. So yeah. And more clothing. 
and much more, yeah, and armor. And Did armor. you eat between the break? And a wig that was somewhere between, you know, like Willie Nelson and and George Washington. I'm not quite sure how that. That was it interesting. Looks good on you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, I have a question for Gare, if you're ready for one. Yeah. Oh. How do you feel? This is from this is from uh, Jenny Jaxie. Hi, I love Jenny. That name. Um, how do you feel Antony changes throughout the play? So if there's if is there some kind of arc of development um, for that character? Well, I think you know the the yeah okay I'll go for that. Uh, I think it's a realization that he isn't infallible, that he isn't indestructible, that he isn't uh, the king of the world. He is uh, he's a man. He's a man who is desperate to continue his relationship with this beautiful woman powerhouse. Uh, and the world, I think, gets smaller for him. It just becomes a smaller place. So I think that's what he goes from, a scale, uh, again, the, what I was saying before about the scale. He just, he just brings it closer. It just becomes a smaller world. Right. Yeah, that makes, um, that makes sense. Do you feel like there's, uh, th like sometimes, sometimes learning happens that you're not conscious of. Do you think that's happening to him or that that's something that he's realizing? You know, is his world just shrinking on him and that's what ha that's, that's. Well, it's also about, uh, you know, um, undivided loyalty and things like that. And uh, betrayal becomes a uh, part of his theme. Uh, and the idea that really, really the only person who betrayed him was himself, I think, ultimately. So he, it's a self-betrayal. It's an, it's an understanding that if you're not true to yourself, you can't possibly ask everyone else to be true. So anyway, there's that kind of thing uh, at play as well. Mm -hmm. But it does come down to, to you know, which side or this side. That's, yeah. Left makes an L. That's how I do it. That's why Antoine's left. Okay. Um, yeah. That's what I would say to that. Yeah. Um, okay. This one's for everybody. Uh, and it's it's from our Jenny Jaxie again. Um, Jenny. Could you speak to the minimalist stagecraft, such as depicting major battles using only sound and costumes? Um, do you remember, do you recall, did the director uh, consider doing any big battle scenes? And um, do you like doing those big, heavy battle scenes? Or is it sort of nice to have a breather where it's a bit more of a metaphor? I, I'm just going to address it quickly. I don't think the play is about that. The thing about this is interesting to me. It is about the conflict of personality, the conflict of this. It's not about that. Those are the, it's a bit like the plays that, to say, Ooh, we should have been outside, Tom. There was a big fight out there and you know, whatever. Um, it, it isn't the important factor. So I think to, that keeping them that, I, I also don't believe, guys, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think um, um, Shakespeare wrote that you had ships crossing the stage and things like that. I don't think that's the thing. I think it's the reportage of it. I think it's the it's the outcome. It's the effect that it has on the individuals. So Gary didn't, I, I to my knowledge, ever think of doing big fighty battle things. Uh, it was it was um, yeah, not like in Cymbeline, for example. You remember in Cymbeline there was a we did big fights and in in in, in mm -hmm. Breath of Kings big fights. You know, uh, this was not about that. Yeah, they're not written. And going back to what we were saying about the Tom Patterson, too, I think, you know, think about what that would actually look like. So we are the number, our cast is the number that we have, right? There's a certain number of people who can't be in that battle. Um, I think the attempt to, to stage a battle with people, especially in a stage like the Tom, the Tom Patterson, just ends up looking redonkulous yeah, yeah redonkulous. it nah. is it'll be five guys on one side and three guys on the other and then they run off and then the next group of guys probably the same guys have to go up like it just it's just not <laughs> It no, and EB, EB would have to be pa passing his Willie Nelson wig back and right. forth. And it would fall knows. off during the battle. Oh. But you know, if, yeah. But it's, the Egyptian it's court was not of... really battle ready in those costumes. <laughs> no, no, in those no. I think I think practically speaking, less is 
less is more. Yeah. And I think what Gare said is absolutely correct. In this play, it's not, there's not even a line, you know, battle. There's just the telling. There's just the telling. The battle is all, everything, it's happening off stage, and then we're dealing with the aftermath or the reporting or, you know, the consequence of that particular victory or that particular loss. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's no real way to depict a fight of that scale. And, you know, they're not like, if, if it was a fight sequence between like two individuals, like if, if that yeah. was me, sure, but, you know, it's like, yeah, armies. <laughs> ships, like ships with thousands of people on them. Yeah. It just wouldn't work out. I think that's why they invented Lego. <laughs> I think there's a quite oh, uh, uh, I saw Red? the fragment of a question and it disappeared so that you could come back. Okay, I've got one for you. Um, uh, Yana, can you compare playing Lady Macbeth to playing Cleopatra, having inhabited them both, what do you actually think about their considerations, intentions, and power? So uh, one of the things I think is that for the lady, while she is a very powerful figure, her power is enacted through her husband. So she, 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 she affects what she wants, if it even is what she wants or not what she wants for her husband. She affects that by being um, a, a side voice. It's a very strong side voice. I mean, she gets him to do a, a lot of things, but it's unlike Cleopatra who is acting for herself, for her own kingdom, you know, uh, it's a very different kind of, it's a different kind of um, impact on, on, on the power. Uh, when I think about when I think about playing them both, like sort of muscle memory, body memory, I felt that the lady had much more um, pent up, pent up, un, un, unrealized in a way, kind of energy than Cleopatra. Cleopatra felt uh not that not that her path is is easy cleopatra's but just that her ability to express her own energy for herself was freer than mm -hmm. also oh, it's interesting because cleopatra was born into it lady m kind of married into it. to it yeah 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 that's a good point um similarly for you gear could you compare your experience playing antony uh, to playing Falstaff in 2016? Uh, just Antony with a lot more weight. No, <laughs> what would have happened had he not died, uh, moved to Stratford, Ontario? No, um, yeah. There's just, there. You, I don't think there's part of your brain that I used for one and used for the other. I think they're so entirely different. Yeah. Um, you know, one, as I was saying earlier, one has the assumption, well, actually, no, that Falstaff also has the assumption that he'll, he'll win out in the end. He's, they've both got huge hearts. One learns about his heart. Falstaff always has the heart. I, I swear the reason he's presented to such a large man is because his capacity for everything, for food, drink, love, laughter, everything is, is right there. That's, that's what it is. He's a living, breathing example of, of it. Uh, yeah, they were completely different uh, approaches. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Falstaff always just misses the lips of the gal he's trying to kiss. Antony gets to enjoy Yana. Hi. Anyway, just uh, so so you get to enjoy the person you're with, whereas Falstaff is always just hitting the wall behind the person's head. <laughs> you know? so. 
Yeah. Um, this one is for, for any and all of you. Um, have you ever played a part that you wished you played before another one? You know, you're playing, well, we can just use these for, for an example. You're playing Cleopatra and you go, man, I wish I had played Cleopatra before I played Lady M because there's a, there's a aha moment as Oprah says. Um, has that, has that ever happened to any of you? Or are you just on the journey you're supposed to be on and you have no qualms? Well, it's interesting going back to play a part that you've played before. Yeah. Mm. And that's, so the, in a way that's, you've learned so much in between, like playing the Falstaff in 2011 and then, when was it? Was it just last year? God, yeah, last year. Um, so, and there's so many, uh, you know, you are just bringing more information. You just have more information, more tools, more uh, life experience and things like that. So uh, there's anything that you play before another part is just going to be of value. Yeah. And I, not to, not to sort of bring a sort of controversial tone to this, but as a woman, I find it is harder for us to have the opportunity to play something again. Hmm. Right. right. I think you get one shot at Juliet. Yeah. You get one shot at, all, all the ingenues, you might get one shot at Viola, you might, you know, mm -hmm. it's very, I don't know of too many examples where women get to revisit roles the way that men do. Yeah. do you I mean, in, in the case of Falstaff, he appears in a couple plays, right? So there's that, but yeah. it's, it's different. It's different. So there's always, there's always the feeling I've had the feeling of, Hmm, man, I wish I could have played that now. Or mm. with all the experience that I've accumulated, I wish I could go back and touch that now. Or... And you know, there's also the thing about playing plays, but different roles in them at different times as mm. well. That's a kind of fun thing. I actually, yeah. uh, well, just I'm just thinking Adrian Gould played Ophelia back in 2008 and when we did the Hamlet the last time. So uh, that was interesting to see Adrian because I played the Polonius the first time and then the Claudius the next time. So mm -hmm. it was interesting seeing Adrian approach it uh, with eight years, nine years difference. But it's playing those, uh, it's, it's too bad actually where, uh, that, that it goes, you play Hamlet first and then a Polonius or Claudius, because in a way you would have liked to have visited the play from yeah. those aspects and mm -hmm. then get your, your Hamlet in the, in the bag. But um, yeah, it's kind of interesting that way too, because again, Oh, oh, I got that now. Oh, oh, but, and there are certain plays that you can watch over and over with different people and it will be a new play every time. That's, that's another joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, different director, different cast, different costume. All of that's gonna. Play in it, uh, yeah. What about you guys? Antoine, TV, any? I don't know what I could have done to prepare for Alexis. <laughs> 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 no but other roles and... yeah yeah for sure i mean you, you like you're saying there is a there is a growth that happens that that will impact future work so um and and in some in some strange ways too I, i've done i've done macbeth four times now in my career and the and i've played seton in three of them wow um and that's always fascinating to give a different Macbeth the news that his wife has killed herself. Mm. Um, because they're all so, all of those people are so different. They're so, they receive the news so differently. You have to approach them differently. You know, what's the, you got to read the room every time. Mm -hmm. um, so that's always fascinating. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I haven't played any, any given lead more than once. Um, but that would be interesting to 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 return to some of them. Um, I, this isn't Shakespeare, but I think about Martin Luther King and the Mountaintop. Coming back to that one would be fascinating. Mm. Knowing what I know now and uh, having several more years of experience under my, under my belt. Um, also, I was thirty six when I played. I was thirty five when I played it, um, and to do that at thirty nine, which was the the age that he was would be fascinating too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about Cyrano uh, because I was lucky enough to be in three productions, but I played an ensemble kind of part, then Christian and then Cyrano. And that kind of thing really does help the knowledge of the play. It really does. You get, yeah. you get Absolutely. kind of, it can, yeah. but you just it cannot, get, but. 
oh, it's just the best. Yeah. Yeah. And you learn from your peers, your, your fellows and ladies and everybody. You just learn from each other. And you, you might not even think you are, but you do. You yeah. learn the how to's, the how to nots. You, um, yeah. I've also played Dennis and As You Like It twice, but that wasn't quite as enriching. Was I don't know. Not so many revelations in that one. <laughs> Dennis. Actually, you know, it's too bad you didn't play the dentist. That would be great. And I, <laughs> Dennis, Dennis as a dentist. You played the dentist? What? That's so weird. But we had a question here. Oh. Yeah. Many people compare Antony and Cleopatra to Romeo and Juliet. Do you see similarities? I was just thinking about that. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of similarities between those two plays. Um, you know, it, both ha both plays have uh, a pair of lovers who um, other people think shouldn't be together, and they're trying to defy the odds that are stacked against them. Um, I you know, watching Antony and Cleopatra as like uh, older, maybe a little more cynical versions of Romeo and Juliet. Um, you think, well, maybe you know they could have they could have benefited from having a friar around to give them a couple of like sound advice. Seems like they're trying to navigate things with the experience that they've that they've garnered, but they, um, they're so. I mean, the stakes are, the stakes are different, but they're 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 the same. They're trying so hard to be with someone else, but you know, Romeo and Juliet's sort of worldview of trust has not been as painted um, as as it seems like it is with Antony and Cleopatra. There's like a real hesitation to, or there's a constant apprehension of feeling like not really secure. Yeah. Feelings for the other person are true. There's that, that the, you know, the political implications of their lived um, situations makes it, I mean, I, I find that it's even harder for them to, make it work because um, it's as if Romeo and Juliet had become the heads of their own respective families. Right. Mm. Well, r and though, it's love, love the first time, right? It's first time love. And uh, Antony and Cleopatra have lived so many loves and they, they're coming to the, the kind of the last hurrah, whereas r and are the first hurrah kind of thing. And there's that uh, approach to it. You know, when you come something, uh, come at something with, I don't know, the possibilities are endless, whereas you know that the only thing endless between Antony and Cleopatra are their days, you know, that are not, I mean, their days are numbered, I should say, coming up. Yeah, so the thing I said in the interview too, we, we talked about in our version of it was the, the you know, the, er, the devastation of the first love being as great, great, in some ways is the devastation of the potential last love. And um, I think it was Lois who said, yeah, you know when your first love is, you don't necessarily know when your last love is, mm -hmm. but you know how many days you have to, to, to go around this whole thing again. And it becomes in many ways more important to end well, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And they're both they're both sort of undone by like what like a stupid lack of, lack of faith and and also fate playing a trick and yeah. you know fate, fate playing yeah playing with fate yeah yeah you know it's really you know the 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 message that Martin delivers equates the the missed letter that Romeo never gets, the message that Romeo never gets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, that's sort of... And, and both Juliet and Cleopatra choose to exit on their own terms. Yeah. Yeah. Way. yeah. So I, I, I think Beck may be frozen again, but she sent me uh, a little thing to read for her as a wrap up, if you guys. Okay. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> uh, she would like to send a massive warm thanks to the actors here for being here. 
um, all the magical magicians getting questions to us and a big thanks to our festival community. Uh, this continues to be a time of big challenge and change. She says she wouldn't be here without the support and love of ACT, a coming together. We're still at it every day. The work does not stop. She wants to continue to thank the hungry, for, the hungry for change heroes at the festival. And for those who are, those of you in our community who are in public support of the big changes we're trying to make. Stratford can be a very difficult place to live and feel safe, especially right now. And she wants to send her love and all of our attention to the people around us fighting big fights that they aren't always talking about. We can't wait to see you again. Thank you and enjoy Anson and Cleopatra. Thank you. Was that, Thank Beck? You, was that okay, Beck? I hope it was. I heard nothing. I oh. love you all. <laughs> Thank you. This was so frustrating this morning. Yeah, but apologies. It was great spending time with you guys. With you too, Gare. You too, and, Evie. Lovely to see yeah. you, Antoine. Great to Thank see all of you everybody. again. It's been a long time. And we'll see Antoine and Romeo and Juliet next week. I'm so glad Woo! we got to talk. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.